specific quality. You have to have uh, this magnetism that attracts these other alpha males, these, these killers, these, these creme de la creme of California criminal society. You have to attract them. If you have that magnetism, you have this leadership quality, you have the intellect, you have the heart. Uh, if you're willing to kill, uh, uh, somebody will sponsor you. Progress in the organization uh, by doing work. You do work, and, and work is, is basically stabbing people. Uh, you kill people in the organization, uh, and that's how you escalate. That's how you, uh, that's how you advance. That's our status mobility system. In society, you have, uh, you have college, you have your job, you have uh, civil servants. Uh, that's your status mobility system. I mean, you're, edu you're educated, you make more money, you move up in, 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 your, in your position in society. In our society, the more people we kill, we advance. The more things we do for the Mexican Mafia, we advance. We gain uh, our social status. We become uh, recognized in the organization. Now, you first have to capture the uh, attention of uh, a specific Mexican Mafia member. So then you'll, you'll be asked to do favors. I mean, this is a... a, a an organization with audacity, uh, with individuals in it uh, willing to kill, uh, hoping to uh, to shock the public, because this 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 shock and awe value uh, of their crimes uh, generates uh, great publicity for them. I mean, you have to understand that these are domestic terrorists, and they they prey on this uh, constant fear that they evoke uh, by the name M Mexican Mafia. We heard that when we were young. It was like, wow, these guys are heavies. And they are hitters. Ah, that may be accurate for the immediate uh, period. I mean, following his arrest, uh, you remove him from uh, that specific neighborhood. But you have to understand that uh, that's when it starts. That's when the individual is going to become a Sudeño or a Norteño. He's going to be placed into his community. Uh, he's going to be placed into a community within prison that, that fosters antisocial behavior. I mean, that thrives on criminal behavior. Uh, and the organization that controls uh, this individual, be it uh, Nuestra Familia, BGF, AB, or M, is going to utilize this individual to infiltrate his neighborhood all over again. Uh, this individual, say he's from Bell Gardens, uh, say he's from Montebello, uh, a Mexican mafia member will contact him and say, who are the connections in your neighborhood? Can you contact them for me? And tell them that you're my representative here and that you want to uh, establish a, a conduit between me and them. And they'll be utilized that way. And we'll, we'll re-infiltrate that, that uh, community and have it even a stronger hold than when you took the youngster out. So all you're doing is you're immersing that kid into a world where uh, there's no regression. I mean, he can't go back. Uh, once he's involved with the Mexican Mafia, it's uh, in for a penny, in for a pound. Uh, you can't get in and say, I don't want to play no more, unless you drop out like I did. After 20 years of my life, I dropped out. Uh, we use a method of, uh, of communication, which I like to call carnival talk. Uh, it sounds innocuous to you and I. But it's nefarious. It's underlying intent. It's nefarious. Say that I had a visitor and I told the visitor, uh, hey, how's uh, Joe doing? Uh, Joe's doing fine. Yeah? Why don't you ask uh, uh, Berta to go over there and see him and uh, make sure she talks to him for me. Uh, give him my very best. Okay. To you, it sounds like uh, Berta's going to go over there and give him regards. But to me, I've just authorized a hit against this individual. Uh, and in any court of law, it can't be proven. Because it sounds so generic, it just sounds generic. I mean, we can talk about money, we can talk about uh, crimes, we can talk about uh, drug collections, extortions, uh, taking cars, pink slips, whatever we want. And uh, we do this all day long. We understand that we're being recorded. And we alter our conversation a bit uh, to sound innocuous. And uh, we have the institutional gang investigators just scratching their head sometimes. And what does this mean? And what does this mean? Any Mexican Mafia member can authorize a, a hit on anybody. As long as it's not a relative of another Mexican Mafia member or a worker of a Mexican Mafia member. Uh, but now it's, it's, it's become like a phenomenon out of control. Uh, there are lists that are four or five pages long and they're authorized hard candy, hard check, personal check, you know. And this is uh, ridiculous to the to the hardcore members of the Mexican Mafia because we believe that an assault, once authorized, should be murder. I mean, it, the individual should be killed because you don't go in to create an enemy. You don't go to assault somebody because it destroys them. I mean, it, their whole resume as a uh, up-and-coming uh, sureño or camarada is, is marred once they're assaulted. So you want to go to whack somebody, I mean, you want to make sure he's killed. So and they use multiple multiple assailants, they use uh, backup shooters, they use bunk cars, I mean, they're strategic, strategically done. I mean, some of them are just done where they stick the gun out the window and boom, they do it. 
you know, but some of them, they're well put together. They're well put together. A conservative estimate, there's 150,000 to 175,000 individuals that know the name Mexican Mafia. They fear it and they will do things for it. Uh, hardcore individuals, say maybe 50,000. Soldados, which are soldiers. Uh, but the group is small, the Mexican Mafia is small in itself. I mean, it has vast influence, vast influence. And that's in California. We're not considering the Arizona, we're not considering the Hawaii faction, we're not considering the federal faction. Uh, this is this is an organization that's truly organized crime. Uh, in our neighborhoods, we're like, how are we equated? Like senators, we represent those areas. We go to the neighborhood and we treat it like, uh, like demigods. You know, this is a big homie, you know? What do you want, you know? Girls, drugs, money, cars, you got it, you know? We make it a uh, profitable proposition. Uh, all these murders that are committed for nothing over the past years, we have hundreds of bodies stacked up, literally hundreds of victims that have been killed by the Mexican Mafia. We, we parlay that, those past victims, even though they didn't pay then, they pay now. They pay now. People pay us for those murders now because we translate this terrorism into finances. Well, you have a facilitator. This individual is usually a, visit a visitor who uh, handles all your communication to the crew chief. The crew chief is the individual who is your right-hand man. He handles, he's a representative on the streets. And from there, you have crew leaders, uh, individuals who run specific areas for you, parts of your territory. As a member, and then below them, there are workers. Those are the guys that are out there actually collecting and selling drugs and doing the extortions for you and enforcing. As a member, you're, you're, you have an organizational entitlement. Uh, you, as soon as you're made, you inherit a piece of turf. Uh, it's usually the area which you hail from. Say, I'm a boxer from Artesia. Uh, as boxer from Artesia, I can uh, conduct any illicit activity in Artesia that I wish, without any opposition from the organization. I don't have any kickbacks to give anybody. I don't owe anybody any money. This is all cream for me. I can also conduct business in the outlying areas as long as it doesn't uh, interfere with another member's uh, business objectives. If it does, we strike a uh, we strike an agreement. I'll give you X amount of money, you let me function here, or, or you give me X amount of money, you can function here. Uh, everybody pays them up. Everybody pays. To do business, we all pay. It's smart business. Um, but I can function anywhere in the state of California, anywhere I wish. Uh, with the full authority of the Mexican Mafia and the full authority of my crew, me being the figurehead of that crew, the ultimate power in that crew, uh, as long as it does not interfere with other members' business. Uh, and if it does, I can easily politic on that member, get him killed, and take over his business. It's that simple. That's all life is in the Mexican Mafia. That's why it's so treacherous. Uh, I used to run quite a large crew, probably one of the most successful crews in Southern California. Uh, and I did it all through visits of mail. Uh, we'd alter their names, we'd alter my name, when they wrote back, and we conducted business out of Pelican Bay for about 10 years. And I was clearing maybe uh, 60 a year from the cell of Pelican Bay. And that's not bad for being in prison, a thousand miles away from your base of power. That's not bad at all. How much is the crew making? Astronomical amounts. I mean, this, this is, I'm, the low, I'm at the low end of the spectrum being paid. Uh, I understand that I'm the figurehead. They're doing all the work. They own legitimate businesses. Uh, we had two legitimate, three legitimate businesses, uh, and they ran them. But underneath that, they were doing uh, illicit drug trade, extortion. Uh, so if they're driving uh, Mercedes Benzes, Lexuses, uh, Escalades, uh, they're pulling in seven figures easy. I mean, the whole haul of the crew is seven figures easy. Uh, they made far greater amounts of money than me. And, and, but I was satisfied with what I got. I was happy. Although with blue-collar money, I, I put my kids to college, I supported my family, and I did well, I think. I know the Mexican Mafia has established ties with La Cosa Nostra and the federal prison system. Although, personally, I never had dealings with them. We had dealings with others, Asians, in Monterey Park. Uh, and we know that they had triads. Uh, we had uh, ties with other organized groups in specific areas, methamphetamine cooks. We had ties with uh, the Arreano Felix clan in uh, Mexico. Uh, Bet. Uh, Marquez had ties. Uh, even some of my crew had ties with some of their lower rung dealers. Uh, there are ties. I mean, anything that makes money is, 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 is what the Mexican Mafia is all about. Anything that increases its political and financial power. And if that means dealing with the uh, African community, that's no problem. Uh, all money is green. 
That's what the Mexican mafia thinks. It's uh, that, that money is, is 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 okay. It's okay to do business with anybody as long as it's profitable. When you have Mexican mafia members associating with senators, uh, politicians, uh, well-meaning individuals who believe in what they're doing is right, have no understanding of the uh, nefarious intent of the Mexican mafia. It will it will stoop to an all-time low to get somebody killed. Uh, and that's what these politicians, that, that, that these clergymen, that some of the administrators have to understand. Uh, the Mexican Mafia will kill, and its whole objective is to control. So when you see these peace objectives, uh, these uh, stopping of the drive-bys, this, no, this is just fluff. This is fluff. This is the Mexican Mafia trying to achieve something here, and it's doing it because it looks good. And it pushes law enforcement off a little bit because uh, law enforcement is going to get bad public relations if they go in there and crack up a peace rally, you know. So they're held back, they're held at bay a bit until they understand the true intent of what the Mexican mafia is doing. It's profiting through the stopping of, uh, of drive-bys is what they're doing, infiltrating neighborhoods, creating representatives in each geographic location in Southern California. This is where the big money pays, and this is where we're becoming true organized crime because we can, can control those gangs. We've displayed it that we can. What, Law enforcement, administrations, uh, all the resources the federal government can't do, we can do. We can control gangs. And as quickly as we can say, don't start, don't, don't do drive, but we can stay, start shooting at cops. That's what the Mexican mafia, the power of the Mexican mafia is vast. Some of the Eastern philosophies, some of the warrior philosophies, Sun Tzu's Art of War, Essays on the Ten Arts of War, uh, Carlos Castaneda. Uh, you have just a variety of different literature that, that the Mexican mafia latches on to. I mean, it's considered uh, uh, Prince, uh, the Prince by Machiavelli, uh, political tactics. I mean, we study all these things. I mean, for anybody to think that some of these Mexican mafia members are illiterate, and there are some that are illiterate, don't 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 uh, misconstrue that to think that every Mexican mafia member is a walking genius or anything, because uh, some of them are just as sharp as rocks. Mm -hmm. uh, but some of the guys sit back. I mean, we're sitting here doing life, and we have nothing better to do than educate ourselves. So we take college courses. I mean, we read all this classical literature, this Eastern philosophy. And uh, it's absorbed. I mean, we utilize this. We put this to work. In terms of the training, I mean, we all go through uh, basic uh, education as to where to hit people. I mean, where vital organs are, the manner in which we hit them, called shifting gears or over-the-shoulder uh, stabbing motions, which are, are best to sink the knife the deepest. Uh, uh, but there's two areas basically concentrated on. That's the chest area, the mid-torso, uh, and the white lower quadrant of uh, the abdominal area under the ribs, which is liver shot. I mean, this is massive hemorrhage either way, and, and, and that's where we try to hit people when we stab them. Uh, in terms of weapon manufacturing and uh, education and assaults, uh, I mean, this is this is this is almost Disneyland stuff because it's it's we learn this as Sudanians. We come up and this is we know how to make bombs, zip guns, uh, explosives, uh, crossbows, knives. Uh, everything. I mean, we're well schooled and uh, well healed. Uh, you put me in any room, anywhere, I'll come out with a weapon, no matter what. I'll come out with something usable. Yeah, I think that would be considered. Uh, you know, you're throwing, uh, you're shooting daggers at somebody, which is a phrase for you know, uh, staring at them harshly. I think that would be a challenge. That's an immediate challenge. I mean, the individual is going to stop and stare back. I mean, that's that's you're issuing the, the response. You know, you're looking at me, I look at you, uh, and it's somebody's going to wait for the shooting drop. Uh, that's definitely uh, you're gonna you're gonna create a a situation there with uh, for the seasoned veteran, uh, the savvy individual. Uh, he'd approach it respectfully, uh, professionally, in control, always protecting himself, but respectfully. I mean, he wouldn't step on their necks, he wouldn't kick them, beat them, uh, sp uh, speak to them in a derogatory manner, you know. But but he would control the situation. And then once he had it in control, he'd, he'd, he'd speak to them like individuals. I mean, I've spoken with gang cops in the streets before, OSS, uh, individuals like that crash. And uh, once we were done proning out, uh, once they were sure that they had the situation secured, that nobody had any weapons, then they put their guns away and they talked to us. Hey, how you doing? Man? Where you been? Uh, how long were you down? Uh, they, they, they try to gain knowledge from you. They try to gain intelligence. But they did it in a respectful manner that didn't come off as like they were trying to uh, bleed you for information. One of the policies of the Mexican Mafia has always been uh, never to assault uh, law enforcement. It was, it, was, it was counterproductive. It was always counterproductive. But there's been a swing uh, in mentality. I mean, we have younger members coming up with uh, more violent, more willing to hurt officers. 
So, I mean, it has to be considered that the, the possibility and the, the true existence of a threat to CDC officials exists and law enforcement because it, that's reality. I mean, the, the game is changing. Uh, the Mexican Mafia is losing some of its uh, intimidation factor with CDC, so they're going to have to resort to taking handcuffs numerous times uh, to do assaults in custody. Uh, we had the Buenostro hit in the attorney room, which is a pretty big hit. Uh, me and Benny Peters uh, slipped our cuffs, extracted knives from our shoes, and uh, stabbed this guy in front of about 50 cops. Uh, and in Los Angeles County Jail, all they're armed with is a flashlight. Uh, they don't have weapons like PR-24s or uh, OC spray. Or they don't have these things in the county jail. Uh, this is back in 92, uh, uh, before the county jail was fully immersed in, in the depth of what the Mexican Mafia was capable of. Uh, and unfortunately, they had to stand around and they watched it while it occurred because they couldn't stop it. Uh, another time, uh, they stabbed an uh, individual Mexican Mafia member by the name of uh, Henry Carlos in a, in a court tank uh, at CCB. Uh, and the only thing that stopped that was that an officer mentioned having a gun. Uh, and that's what stopped that, that, that hit. I mean, I used to practice uh, in Pelican Bay making cuff keys. You can do it with a bobby pin. Uh, it's, it's not that difficult to open cuffs. I mean, uh, any type of cuff that's designed, uh, we all we have is time to sit back and figure out how to open it up. Any type of device that you create, uh, other than black boxes. Black boxes are very efficient. Uh, everybody's familiar with the black box? Mm -hmm. uh, they are very efficient. Uh, and that's why everybody hates them in the CDC. They're uncomfortable and they can't be taken off. But if it's regular cuffs, people can take off their cuffs. People do have knives. I had a knife on me for five years straight, in shoe, Pelican Bay. I had a key on me for five years straight, a real key, a real knife. Uh, just uh, this is the reality in prison. This is what the CDC officers and custodial officers have to understand. Individuals are armed, seriously armed, uh, and they're willing to commit. Texas violence. Mexican mafia enforcer in federal court to answer charges, including his involvement in at least three unsolved murder cases. 36-year-old Ruben Reyes is also suspected of ordering the hit of Balcony Tights police officer Julian Pastina this past May. KSAT 12's Tim Gerber live outside the federal courthouse with the very latest. Tim? Well, Reyes was brought here after being arrested by FBI agents for his initial appearance. And by the way, we were the only media present here this morning as he was being walked into that courthouse flanked by FBI agents. According to a criminal complaint filed today, Reyes is accused of murdering three high-ranking members of the Texas Mexican Mafia who had been removed from power after being accused of mishandling approximately $60,000. The victims have been identified as Mark Anthony Bernal, a captain in the Texas Mexican Mafia, Carlos Chapa, a general, and Johnny Solis, the lieutenant of lieutenants. All three were killed by Reyes back in December 2013. Reyes told investigators he was involved in those murders when he went to SAPD investigators earlier this month after he was the target of a failed hit by the Texas Mexican Mafia. He was shot in that attack but survived. He told investigators the bodies of those victims were set on fire and buried in shallow graves in Pearsall, and that's where they were recovered. While there is nothing in the criminal complaint today, uh, Sources tell us Reyes also ordered the hit on Balcones Heights police officer Julian Pacina this past May. Pacina was believed to have had ties to the Texas Mexican Mafia and was under investigation when he was murdered. Uh, Reyes's involvement in Pacina's murder is part of an ongoing investigation, and that's all that U.S. attorneys would tell us today. Reyes did have his initial hearing here today. He was basically told what the charges are against him, and then it was asked that he be held without bond. That was granted, so he will now have his next bond hearing next week. We'll have more for you on this case coming up at the bottom of the hour. For now, reporting live outside the federal courthouse, I'm Tim Gerber. Case in. A major blow to the Mexican Mafia in Southern California. Raids led to dozens of arrests. CBS 2's Dave Lopez is live in downtown L.A. with information on what the gang members are accused of. Dave. Well, all kinds of things, all the way to murder, racketeering, embezzlement, uh, drug trafficking, all from behind bars. 87 were targeted, all but 16 were arrested, so 16 fugitives. So detectives say this was a very good day for them as far as this uh, investigation went that lasted almost four years. I'm not going to 
say that uh, we've decimated this gang. We have made a very substantial blow against this gang. And the numbers are impressive. In a pre-dawn raid, more than 500 law enforcement officers arrested 32 alleged gang members off the street and 35 alleged members of the Mexican mafia who were serving time in L.A. County Jail awaiting their trials, transferred them to federal custody, and included in the arrest the so-called ringleader, Jose Landa Rodriguez, described by some gang experts to me as, quote, the most powerful, influential inmate in county jail. Landa Rodriguez controlled all drug trafficking in the jails. The indictment alleges all on orders from Landa Rodriguez, 55 years of age. And the indictment says he had help from an attorney, Gabriel Sendejas Chavez, who was arrested this morning at his home in Ontario. The contraband is already inside the inside the cell. Detectives say the Mexican mafia had such control and the system was so well run that anyone who didn't cooperate or try to go against them was beaten. Stabbed, kidnapped, and killed. These attacks were designed to instill discipline for violating Mexican mafia rules. Detectives say this is taken from security video in the jail that shows Mexican mafia members beating an inmate who wouldn't cooperate. And the indictment also says that Landa Rodriguez ordered at least three murders out on the street. Uh, weapons that uh, we recover. The investigation alleges that Landa Rodriguez had such power that from behind bars, he would order gang members on the street to purposely break the law and get arrested so they could smuggle drugs into the county jail. Again, investigators say that the Mexican mafia has been crippled, not completely taken out of business, but their leader is gone. And a big question is, how was he able to stay in county jail for almost four years to do all of this and never have to go to court for whatever he was being charged with for embezzlement? The answer there is his attorney. The black can is a sacred symbol of the Mexican mafia. It is known throughout the Hispanic community and the Hispanic gang subculture, including rivals. Uh, the Mexican mafia adopted this symbol as its own from La Cosa Nostra, which was known as the combination at the time. As it was, as it was explained to me by my padrino, the combination was a group working the Fulton Fish Market and Longshoremen in New York. Uh, they worked these areas and they would steal merchandise, uh, crates and barrels. And their hands were dirty when they would handle uh, these pieces of merchandise. Unbeknownst to these individuals, their impression or the imprint of dirt or grease on their hands would be left on the merchandise. For other people who worked in that area, they understood that this belonged to the combination and oftentimes it had black impressions or black prints on the sides of the crates of merchandise and they knew not to steal it because it belonged to La Cosa Nostra. The Mexican Mafia adopted this symbol as its own uh, and called it the Black Hand of Death. This is an important image for the organization. It's, it's been utilized as a form of terror, indoctrination, and respect and awe. Every Sudeño throughout the United States understands what the Black Hand is. Every rival of the organization knows what the Black Hand represents. Even the Hispanic communities, uh, in a large part in California and the Southwest, understand what the Black Hand means. This has become ingrained in the lore of the prison subculture, Hispanic gang subculture, and mainstream community. This is our one identifying symbol. Uh, it's typically the left hand that's pointed outwards in a tattoo or a left hand print. It may appear to be the right, but it's considered that the left hand is insidious in some fashion. And this is why the Mexican Mafia typically uses the left hand to represent its symbol. Oftentimes it's emblazoned with an M or the word M somehow integrated within the palm. I personally have one tattooed on my chest and a variety of different members, a host of different members, utilize this symbol as well. Again, I can't emphasize the strength of this symbol. It's been so ingrained into the rank and file of our infrastructure that it is immediately recognizable and it denotes membership. Uh, it also represents a symbol of terror, and, and we utilize terror. I mean, often, this is the bread and butter of the organization. So everything that we evolve ourselves in, everything that we project is a form of terror. Just the image itself is ominous. You look at it, it doesn't look warm and fuzzy. It is threatening. The, the tattoo and the symbol itself is threatening. And, and this is understood that the black hand is about death. The Mexican Mafia is death. This is a modern day murder ink. 
The Mexican Mafia is known for its violence. It will participate in violence, and it will do it with impunity. Members don't care if people see. Members don't care if they get convicted, and members don't care if they go to death row. All members understand this. It's instinctual. This is what you joined, a mafia. We are there to kill people. We are there to control. It's about power and violence. And this is ingrained in the psyche of every member and every Sudeño. The Mexican Mafia tattoo and symbol is considered a right earned by members who are inducted into the organization. For an individual to utilize this symbol, otherwise incorporating it in artwork, artistic expression, or tattoos, is uh, punishable by death. Nobody can use this symbol. It's almost as if it's a copyright or a trademark for the organization. And the rank and file understand this. Everybody understands to even write the word Emme, let alone use the symbol of the black hand, is punishable by death. Without exception, there are no passes, there are no exceptions, there are no exclusions. However, there are females, facilitators, las señoras, who utilize this symbol, but they do so in a fashion that incorporates their husband's name above or below or within the black hand. And in this manner, they can state that they are merely stating that their husband is from the Mexican Mafia. But women sometimes do incorporate the word M or the black hand as tattoo body art. There are a variety of different symbols utilized by the organization, the predominant symbol being the black hand. But there's also a Mayan numeric system, uh, which would incorporate the two bars and three dots. The two bars equal five apiece, and the three dots equal three. Uh, cumulatively, they add up to 13. 13 has an alphanumeric correspondence which is the letter M. The letter M in Spanish is M. Individuals utilizing this symbol are typically Sureños, and it identifies their adherence and adoption of ideology of the Mexican Mafia. The Mexican Mafia also utilizes, at times, La Mariposa. La Mariposa is the butterfly. Uh, the butterfly, in and of itself, does not indicate membership, but it is a code name uh, for the Mexican Mafia. Uh, we speak of La Mariposa when we don't want others to understand that we're speaking of the Mexican Mafia. Uh, there are a host of other different variations and utilizations of the word eme, including the word emero, which I have tattooed on my bicep, or the word simply eme, or los famosos. Los famosos means the famous ones in, Spanish, in, in English. Uh, these tattoos, including the word emero, are often utilized by Mexican Mafia members. Uh, one of the tricks used by Mexican Mafia members in order to conceal their membership uh, is to incorporate the word or letters or black hand within body art. Uh, this is done in, in, in a number of different ways, including the incorporation of the word M, M, Emero, Mafia, within the design of Aztec headbands and artwork. In dark shaded areas, the Mexican Mafia members sometimes incorporate the black hand. Uh, but as, as many ideas I can come up with, there are a variety of different other ways. Uh, these symbols are often utilized by members. Uh, sometimes Sudanians also utilize body art. Uh, and at first blush, tattoos appear to be tattoos. But to the astute individual, you can see and detect his affiliation and the level of his affiliation through his tattoos. For instance, the word Sur, South Side, or Southerner is often incorporated by Sudanians uh, throughout the United States. But to determine whether this individual is an authentic Sudeño or an emulator, you merely need to look at his tattoos. If he's incorporated, incorporated Aztec artwork, uh, Mexican culture, uh, a variety of different prison-themed tattoos, it's easy to identify this individual as an individual who has adopted the ideology and surrendered his autonomy to the Mexican Mafia. A simple look at these tattoos will tell you exactly who the individual is. I can look at a typical gang member uh, and tell whether he's been to prison or not. It's, it's a practice. It's, it's a knowledge that, that you gain with experience. Uh, so these tattoos actually still tell a story. I mean, they're not simply body art. They're indicative of a much more nefarious uh, purpose and reason. The Mexican Mafia does not participate in graffiti. It, it is unheard of for a Mexican Mafia member to go sc scratching or spray painting on walls. It does happen in some prison settings, but it's frowned upon because the membership knows that it will eventually be crossed off by an enemy, thereby dishonoring the organization. So then you'll know this as well. 
they understand that to write the word eme, even as a form of homage, is, is punishable by death. This is just unheard of in our subculture. With an organization, to claim that title is immediate death. There is no equivocation on this topic. For some of the graffiti that's been popping up throughout the nation and across the world, this has to be the work of emulators, as Sudeños would not conduct this type of activity. They would not participate in this. This is well understood among the rank and file of the Sudeños. This is a sacrilegious act to the organization. So it's obviously the work of somebody mimicking something they heard or a behavior that they believe is expected of them. New tonight, a dismembered body found in a barrel. We're now learning more about the man police say put the victim in there and what they say led up to that murder. Kim Passoff looking through the evidence presented to a grand jury is live outside the Clark County Detention Center with more. Yeah, so this is Ryan Bentley. He is locked up here tonight. Police say that he is behind a grisly murder. In November, a contractor for Public Works found an abandoned barrel, and when he opened the lid to see if it contained any hazardous materials, he was hit by the stench of decomposing flesh. These are new pictures where investigators say the murder took place. Bullet holes through a garage door, continuing through to hit the outside of a home. On November 29th, human remains, a head and torso missing its arms, were found in a barrel near Russell and Mountain Vista, along with a bottle of bleach. The victim, identified by the Clark County Coroner's Office as Rene Olamos Enriquez Jr., reported missing earlier in the month. Hello, this is a free call from... An incarcerated individual at Clark County Detention Center. Hello. That is one of a series of jailhouse calls prosecutors say Bentley made when he was arrested. First, right after the murder, and then later, after he was released, disposed of the body in the barrel, and again was arrested. I have, I haven't. I, uh, I went, I went past it. Uh, the house is cleaned up? Yeah. Uh, cool. Police were first called to the area where the murder occurred for reports of gunshots, but there was no evidence at the time that Bentley was the one who fired them. Bentley was arrested for narcotics possession. This is a copy of a search warrant response from Meta, the parent company of Facebook, handing over information about Bentley's online conversations. Investigators say it helps prove his involvement. Quote, I either need new Sawzall blades or Cash App so I can ride bike to buy some. I just need hot water to activate the lie. Angelica was here. She helped me fill up that drum. Bro, the blank me and her had to do compared with cartel videos. And a second suspect, Angelica Hudson, was also charged with the murder, but the state has since dropped those charges. Right now, Bentley is facing murder charges as well as conspiracy to commit murder charges. Police say that Bentley believed that the victim was a snitch and had told police about his drug business. Reporting live tonight outside of the Clark County Detention Center, Kim Passoff, Fox 5 News, local Las Vegas. Bentley's arraignment hearing was scheduled for this Thursday, but it's now been continued. A new date has not yet been announced. Hey, what's going on, you guys? Welcome back to Greenlit Gang TV. Today, we're going to be talking about Rene Boxer Enriquez, a notorious Mexican Mafia member, also very notorious Mexican Mafia snitch, who in the early 2000s defected from the gang, uh, proceeded to turn state evidence, and has participated in Dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of racketeering cases um, and other criminal cases, conspiracy cases at the state and federal government level. Um, the guy, the amount of work he put in uh, to help his gang and to help the Mexican mafia grow behind prison walls and out on the streets, he's put just that amount of work in to help the, the authorities, to help the police put criminals just like himself away, which ultimately a lot of people believe, and I personally believed, helped with his release in uh, July of 2022. He was finally granted parole after all these years. Um, and we'll get into his crimes and why a lot of people still believe today he should have never been let out. Uh, but anyway, he was born July 7th, 1962 in Artesia, California. Uh, currently he's about 61, 62 years old. 
Um, you know, what's interesting about him is he came from a decent middle class family. So he was a smart kid, had, uh, had a future in academics, parents owned a, owned a little business. Uh, his dad actually at one point was hoping that his son would take over the family business. But uh, I'd say his biggest, the one thing I read that was one of his biggest obstacles was, what they, was that he idolized his brother Mark, uh, who was already, uh, when Rene was kind of getting into the streets or kind of starting to maybe veer the other way, um, was already a member of Art of 13, a Sereno gang set. Said he grew up in Cerritos, California, and I really hope I pronounced that right. If not, you know, feel free to let me know. But he was hanging out in Artesia, California. By ninth grade, he dropped out, had got jumped into the gang. Um, in a little bit before that was when this kind of stuff picked up, right? 12 years old, his brother's having him do little local neighborhood break-ins. Um, drinking alcohol, said he was doing PCP, LSD, was starting to deal the stuff. I'm sure you can throw in marijuana, cocaine, all that good stuff. Uh, began dealing the drugs, like I said. So all this is going on. He drops out. He gets jumped in. And uh, he even testified when he was out there. You know, like I said, this guy's been testifying for years in criminal cases. Uh, he told a story in 2015 at a court appearance how uh, he remembers being savagely beat up by his brother and uh, some local and some fellow gang members as part of his jumping in process behind a gas station. It's kind of interesting what what people will remember all these years later and things that really stick with them. And you can tell he definitely looked up to his brother Mark. And his brother Mark was actually the one who gave him the nickname Boxer uh, that you see today whenever you do any sort of research on him. So we started breaking into houses all around the neighborhood. His brother Mark put him up to it. Uh, Also began robbing convenience stores. That's where he kind of first starts picking up a criminal record, right? Juvenile record. Gets a longer prison sentence for these armed robberies. In his late teens, this is where he first comes across La Ame or the Mexican Mafia doing time at the uh, Duvel Vocational Institution, which is actually 1957, where the Mexican Mafia was formed by 13 Hispanic gang members. Some of those more famous founders, Joseph Morgan, Mundo Mendoza, Luis Flores, Eddie Gonzalez. I'm sure I'm forgetting a couple. These are just ones right off the top that I read about. Um, I, I cannot emphasize enough the power that the Mexican mafia wields, the black hand of death. You hear him talk about it, what that black hand symbolizes, the fear, the legitimate fear it strikes into people and, um, the power that they wield not only on the street level, but they have so much power in the prison systems. And from the prison systems, they're able to control the streets. And I understand a lot of gangs control the streets from the prison system, but the Mexican mafia is at a whole nother level. And you hear about Rene Enriquez, you hear him in these videos where he's talking about, you got to have that spark. You got to have that um, ability to draw people in, that charisma. You got to be likable. You got to be smart. You got to be well-spoken. You can't be a dummy. They don't just let anybody in. You know, some of these street gangs, you see, they're they're taking anybody just to get their numbers up. The Mexican mafia is not doing that, okay? You better bring something serious to the table. And like other big-time prison gangs, once you're in, you're in for life, Unless, like what he stated, he even states, unless like himself, we defect, you go to protective custody, and then you're marked for death. So he's in the vocational institution, Duvel Vocational, which is in Tracy, California. He begins putting in work for the Mexican Mafia. Stabs an inmate from L.A. The guy survived, although his next victim wasn't so lucky. He actually killed... Uh, an, impri- an imprisoned Vagos Motorcycle Club member went by the name of Chainsaw. Um, you know, so he starts picking up a rep pretty early on. By 1985, he is a made member of the Mexican Mafia or Carnale, uh, which just means brother in Spanish. And kind of what I was talking about, the charisma and all that. And you can see when he talks. And you see this with other really high-ranking, legitimate gang members. Um, and I get, I get he snitched, I get he told, but what he's saying is he was an arrogant elitist. He believed he was better than everybody else. And he talks about how you kind of have to have that belief in yourself when you're rising to the ranks that him and his fellow gang members are rising to in, like I said, one of the most powerful 
street gangs and prison gangs in the world, pretty much. Um, like I read, you know, they're very most prevalent in Southern California, okay? But they are everywhere. Texas, Arizona, um, I mean, it, it, I'm reading Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico. I mean, it, and they participate in everything. Drug trafficking, extortion, money laundering, robbery, assault, murder. Um, and again, you know, they have a lot of high profile crimes that make the news. That's the reason I put a couple of those cases in clips for you guys to get an idea of the kind of power they wield. Um, it's just hard to put into words um, the power that they truly, truly have in the shots of Cohen. He really does put it into pretty good words when talking in these videos um, about what they're able to do and basically how they run the prisons. You know, the, the cops and the COs think they know. He says at all times they carry weapons. At all times they can, they can act. They choose not to commit violence uh, when really at all times they, somebody has a weapon, somebody has a knife. He says, you put me in any room, I'll come out with a weapon. So he's putting in work. Like you said, he's an arrogant elitist, believes he's better than everybody else. Um, and he really helped the Mexican mafia begin to take over even more of the prison system, which, which, you know, kind of infiltrates out, seeps out to the street level. Um, and at the end of the day, like he said, it's all about making money, the betterment of the gang. When you give your life to the gang, you are sacrificing everything. It said with the black hand, they kind of took that after, uh, uh, La Cosa Nostra, the mafia, the mob, uh, from Ita uh, Italy, uh, so I'm not saying their beliefs are structured, but they were greatly influenced by, you know, when you give your life to this, this comes before everything that the black hand even had kind of a tie to uh, the Italian mob. Um, so that's all in the mid eighties and all that. He's doing all that wall locked up in 1989. He's paroled. And this is where he really starts to pick up, um, some serious street cred, but also this is where his, you could say, downfall takes place. Um, he jumps right back into the street life. He'd been, a, he'd been given a territory. So you got to remember the amount of power you get. Once you become a Mexican mafia member and you get back out on the streets, you are basically untouchable unless the gang chooses to do something to, to one of their own. He's assigned to territories by leaders of the Mexican mafia in which you extort a street tax from other gang members and dealers in that area. They didn't pay, you're killed, you're beat up. Um, it's kind of like that saying, I hope I say this right, plato or, or pluma, uh, basically silver or lead. You're gonna go along to get along. Or we're just gonna put a bullet in you and there's gonna be somebody else who comes right up to come do your job. There's a long line of, of people that, that want um, want to be in with us, want to say they have ties to us and, and they offer these dealers protection. He was committed, you know, the two murders that he was basically really tied to while out conducting business out on the streets, okay, um, were he put a contract on a girl that he says was dealing drugs, Cynthia Gavaldan, who I really hope I'm saying that right. She was 28 at the time, suspected of basically getting around the street tax, right, which in his eyes is, is like stealing from him, um, put a hit on her. She was shot in the head and dumped in an abandoned lot. A um, little interesting side note. Her kids were at a lot of his parole hearings, really pushing back against his release. And they were pushing back against the fact that uh, he was saying she was a drug dealer. The kids were saying that she had some struggles, but that she wasn't doing what he was basically saying she was doing. Um, and then the other murder, which he actually personally killed this gentleman, David Gallegos. He wasn't actually a made member um, got into a gunfight and he ran away, which is just complete disrespect. It's shameful. And uh, you could probably imagine the anger that members had seeing him run away because of the vetting process, because they don't just let anybody in. So to see that happen, he was once again marked uh, for death. And uh, this is pretty crazy. Uh, Rene Boxer Enriquez forcibly overdosed Gallegos with uh, heroin. And then shot him five times in the head and leaving him in an alley. Now, I want you to remember that story about him forcing him to overdose, okay? Just 
keep that in the back of your head. Eventually, he was arrested and charged with uh, Galvaldon's murder. He ended up pleading guilty and was given life. Another kind of incident. In 1991, he's at a lawyer's interview room in L.A. County Jail. Enriquez and another inmate, they stabbed a Mexican mafia leader, Salvador Mon Buenrostro, 30 times. Salvador did survive. But again, it shows you he was a leader of the Mexican Mafia and, and Rene Boxer Enriquez did this. And he would not have done it without permission or maybe he was higher ranking than him. And he okayed himself and they attacked him. Very violent, very mean, um, unhinged. And he talks about it, did not care. The gang came before everything. Work, putting in work, respect, money, it's all first. By 1993, he's sent to Pelican Bay, which is way up. California's north coast the shoe right they've done 60 minutes on the shoe they've done a lot of famous things about the shoe Um, it's just segregated housing unit but Pelican Bay is is notorious Um, spend 23 hours a day alone in their cell small amount of yard time which basically just means you go to another cage Um, and uh, it's just uh, a place you basically go he even stated you get out you can smell the redwoods, you can smell the forest, but the minute you get into the building, the depression, the anxiety, he said it was a, Rene Boxer Enriquez stated it's a place you go to die, um, which I, I firmly believe that. Um, but, so he's in the shoe, like they said, okay, so apparently he's got to change of heart. And by 2003, he's been locked up, spent a lot of time in prison. Um, but remember, I, I, he chose this life and he chose to murder these people. And I did read something where he committed some of these murders on his own, but apparently he was tied to whether ordering, participating, being aware of, he was tied to about 10 murders in total, um, which is, which is a very, very high number. Um, he ends up in 2003 deciding to leave the Mexican mafia and uh, not only did he leave, but he began his journey of becoming one of the biggest Mexican Mafia's defectors ever. He helped participate in dozens, like I said, state and federal racketeering trials, multiple, multiple charges all over different cases, putting a lot of people away, a lot of gang members behind bars, Becomes quickly becomes the most hated ex-gang member out there. He... And and you read this when you read about him. There were a lot of people that were mad about this. He began speaking, you know, the, the security measures that were taken to protect him were extreme. Booking men under false name, false charges, um, flying him by helicopter, these planes to speak at these conferences and these events, um, you know, housing him in hidden areas of the jails and prisons. Um, and, and there's varying opinions. Some say... This organization, the Mexican Mafia, La Eme, is so hard to infiltrate. If you got to dance with the devil, as in Rene Boxer Enriquez, you got to dance with the devil. We got to get what we can. If it means caving a little bit on some of our beliefs and, and you know, hiding this guy under different names or different charges or, or flying him out to these conferences where he gets obviously a lot more freedoms, gets to eat better food. I mean, he's out. He's flying by helicopter. He's going to these conferences. And someone with his personality, I mean, you guys let me know what you think, but someone with his personality, you know, he's well-spoken and he spoke about it himself, this grandiose view of himself, this elitist view you had to know, and I think, I don't know what you guys think, I think he was eating this stuff up, where these hot, you know, these are these are detectives and cops and federal agents, they're hanging on every word that Rene Enriquez is saying, right, they're listening, they're jotting notes down, they're doing, they're flying him out to conferences, as he's serving double life as a convicted murderer, um, you know, armed robbery, all these things that he's convicted of, and, and these guys are just eating it up basically you could say they're eating out of the palm of his hand um you know that's kind of the flip side of that but it, if it meant locking other people up and uh you know kind of what's good for the greater good that's that there's, there's a lot of different sides to that and i really want to know what you guys think um so please you know after this feel free to comment let me know uh would you 
Would you be working with him or would you lock him up, throw away the key? I don't care what information you know. You can sit there and rot. Uh, He was denied parole many times, Uh, not only for the safety of the public, but they said for his own safety and his family's safety because the Mexican mafia, basically they can get to anybody. And they feared that if they let him out, him or whoever he's around is quickly going to be killed. Um, Like I stated, Cynthia... Gavaldon's family always showed up at his parole hearings to speak out against him and speak out against his release. Um, Finally, though, Governor Gavin Newsom uh, grants his parole in July of 22. He eventually gets out. Last point, last part of the story. Kind of a big part, right? They talk about the sins of the father. His son... Enriquez Jr., the age of 39, was murdered in Las Vegas. They said it happened in early November of 2023. He was in the drug game. His house had been raided about a year prior in October of 2022. Serious amounts of meth, heroin, fentanyl were found. And just like his dad, it was thought that Enriquez Jr. had cooperated Uh, The police tried to say he was released to medical personnel, um, why he wasn't with the police at the time he was released to medical personnel to be treated. A lot of people said, no, he was uh, was over there cooperating. Friends said he snitched. People, the the, the word was in his circle, Enriquez Jr. had had snitched. Um, And um, Apparently, after his arrest and release, one of his friends, or what he thought was his friend's 43-year-old Ryan Bentley, offered Enriquez Jr. a care package. When a care package in the drug game basically means, hey, man, we know you just got raided. We know you just lost all your drugs, all your money. You're down bad. I'm going to give you this care package, these drugs, to get you back up and running again. Um, they believe Ryan Bentley used that as a ruse to get Enriquez Jr. to come over to, uh, to a house that Bentley was at where he's Enriquez Jr. is ultimately confronted by Bentley and two other guys. Now, remember how I told you to remember the part about where boxer Enriquez Sr. forced David Gallegos to overdose on heroin and shot him five times? Well, apparently these guys told Enriquez Jr. you got two options. You can snort these lines of fentanyl and kill yourself, or we can kill you ourselves. Apparently, Enriquez Jr. chose to snort the lines of fentanyl and kill himself. That's just crazy. That's just absolutely crazy to me how that came full circle. Um, And I'm not saying it in a good way. I mean, this whole story is pretty sad. A lot of these stories I do are basically just sad. But it is interesting. I don't care what anybody says. It's it's very interesting. And uh, some would say karmic debt was paid. Um... Others would say it's a tragedy. Uh, I want to know what you guys think, though. Um, His body was eventually discovered in a 55-gallon drum in Clark County in Las Vegas. Um, Ryan Bentley and one of his accomplices, Angelica Hudson, they've been charged with murder. Um, That case is still pending. But anyway, there you have it. Renee Boxer Enriquez. Uh, Really, really enjoyed doing this story. Hope you guys enjoy it. And uh, thank you for the time.